Welcome to Around the Weird. Here's your host, the museum curator of the strange and unusual, Mr. Nothing. Thank you, mysterious voice, and welcome back to Around the Weird, a booktube channel where I talk about all the unusual and out of the ordinary literature that I have found in my travels. Today, I want to talk about a book that I read, one that is from one of my favorite authors, a classic author from the 1900s. I am referring to Cannery Row by John Steinbeck, which was published in 1945. For those who don't know, and I have a feeling a lot of people know who Steinbeck is, which I've probably said that before, uh, but, um, and if you've ever watched, you know, the videos I've talked, where I've talked about Steinbeck, you you probably know who he is. Um, But for those who don't, John Steinbeck was an author who lived in the 1900s, primarily writing um, stories of individuals, of movement, stuff like that. Uh, he's primarily known for uh, of Grapes of, or grapes of Wrath, Of Mice and Men, and Dubious Battle, I'd say are his biggest stories, um, which I which could be called the Working Man's Trilogy or the, the Union Trilogy, where he basically argues that corporations are harming individuals by trying to maximize their profits at the cost of uh, how much an individual takes home, and the rights that the worker has. And I've read all three of those stories. Very phenomenal. Uh, he's written some other stuff, like Cannery Row, which I'm talking about today, Tortilla Flat, which I haven't read yet, uh, some essays here and there, uh, and he's also uh, written one of my favorite uh, books of all time, East of Eden, which is a generational story about the uh, Trask family living in the um, living in, in California and dealing with the unresolved issues that they have through the generations. I, I definitely recommend that you go read that one because it is phenomenal. Uh, it's probably one of the best books written in the 1900s. Uh, and Lucas from the Bits of Lit can tell you, for, you know, like that it's great. Um, I certainly very much love it. I haven't talked about it on this channel though. But anyways, that's that's John Steinbeck, a very fascinating writer who I think history has judged pretty fairly, uh, even if um, some of his writing is pretty sexist and, and racist at times, which you'll see in Cannery Row too. Uh, so without further ado, let's talk about Cannery Row. Did I enjoy it? Let's find out. I'll do a summary, a little bit of an analysis, and we will move on from there. So Cannery Row focuses on a, a neighborhood in the Monterey region of California, where uh, it's essentially Cannery Row. It's the uh, the neighborhood where the canneries are at, where the fish fishermen happen to be, uh, where, where a lot of immigrants seem to reside. Uh, and one of the people who lives there is Lee Chong. He owns the grocery store and uh in the cannery row area um and he he seems to be doing a pretty good job uh his depiction is kind of racist as as i mentioned um is common with steinbeck stories especially of asian men and uh but lee is hard working and and wants to be wants to fit in 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 cannery row but also in america at large uh, and one day he's bequeathed uh, the Abbeville place, which is sort of a, a flop house of sorts. And um, but th- that happens before the current owner commits suicide. Uh, and Lee Chong provides for that family. Uh, but um, it, uh, before doing anything with it, Mac, uh, some, some ne'er-do-wells, some young men who don't really have any job layabouts, I think is the proper term. They come up to him and are like, hey, can we live there? We'll pay you rent and take good care of it. And Lee Chong just agrees to that uh, because Mac isn't really that bad of a person. Uh, the story also focuses somewhat on Dora Flood, uh, who owns what I'm assuming is a brothel. Um, and the community tolerates it because Dora gives uh, a good amount of money back to the community and helps make sure that it thrives. Um, but she does have to kind of hide and duck every now and then when people say that what Dora is doing is wrong. Uh, the story focuses a little bit on her, her on, a, on a bouncer named William, who is unhappy that no one seems to like him outside of Dora's, um, Dora's brothel. 
and the story also focuses on Mac and his friends. Mac is sort of the leader of his gang of layabouts who aren't intentionally harmful, but they they're they're clearly not. They don't have jobs. They if they do work, it's it's as little as possible, and they they take advantage of everyone when they can uh in order to get food get get shelter get a place to live i think he the way mac gets into the the flop house where he's living is that he he pretty much insinuates that he's going to burn it down if Lee doesn't give it to him. Or Lee believes that, but Mac has to insinuate that in order for Lee to believe it. Um, the story also focuses on a character named Doc, who is a sort of a scientist operating a museum type thing in, in Cannery Row. Um, it's called Western Biological, and he frequently goes out and looks for animals and uh, tries to teach people, you know, what what's what about fish and reptiles and all of that. But you see at various points in the story, Mac conning people, uh, including Doc, <laughs> a little bit, even though it, it, he doesn't seem to be going out of his way to hurt Doc. Mac uh, convinces people to get on his side, uh, and he, he promises Doc that he'll bring him, like, a certain number of frogs for a certain price. And in the process of getting those frogs, he ends up giving them to a bunch of people in the community um, as payment, uh, and they can transfer those frogs over to Doc. And he ends up getting get, getting rid of all the frogs, thereby making it putting the boat burden on those people to sell the frogs to Doc. Um, and if you know if Doc doesn't want to buy the frogs, then uh, Mac pretty much stole those frogs from uh, from or stole money from from those people. We also hear more about what Dora does, such as uh, when the town was uh, sick with the flu, um, Dora and her uh, her staff uh, worked to uh, get um, get medicine and, and other necessary things out to the people who were sick. So it's very clear that Dora is an integral part of the community, even if not everyone in the community sees her as valuable. Um, Doc sees a dead body at one point in this story, kind of a tangent there, but uh, um, he becomes sickened, which is kind of interesting given that he's supposed to be a guy of science and seeing a dead body just makes him filled with unease. And he ends up taking out this unease, this anger out on Mac, who had a party at his place. It was supposed to be a party for Doc, but the party grew out of control and Doc never showed up. And um, Mac accepts that this this was coming to him, uh, which makes, you know, any any like getting mad at him kind of hard because he's he's willing to accept that he's a layabout and it's sort of a con man and um I, I guess accepting it doesn't make it any better but um uh doc ends up forgiving him and uh agreeing that as long as mac tried to fix something or made any effort at all um uh like doc wouldn't be as angry as he would be uh, the city also goes through a number of misfortunes, but just as quickly those misfortunes ease up uh, through the passage of time. It's a pretty unusual spot in the book where it doesn't seem like Steinbeck has a lot to say. And then um, Doc, at the end of the story, uh, Mac decides to throw another party for Doc and makes sure that Doc actually shows up. And the party is described as pretty chaotic with... Um, a bunch of fights ensuing and the police showing up and Mac and his boys stealing the police car and everything just going as, as strange as possible, but the community being tight-knit and loving one another in the process. And as the story ends, Doc and, and the community members focus on, on life, or they reflect on life and, and how uh, Cannery Row seems to be a quality place to live, even if it isn't, uh, you know, the best of places. And that's where the story ends there. In terms of analysis, one of the themes of this story is that of community. So Cannery Row is united. Like the people are bonded together, I think in their own misfortune, because uh, Cannery Row doesn't seem to be that well to do of a neighborhood. It's in the Cannery district, of course. So like, there's the constant smell of, of seafood and, and fish and, and all kinds of gross stuff like that. And the people don't seem to have a lot of money. Like Lee, Lee has um, his grocery store, but it, 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 it hasn't pushed him into the stratosphere with money. He's still doing his best, making ends meet whatever way he can. Uh, but the community is still united in, in a lot of ways. They help each other out whenever possible. 
Lee giving Mac a place to live, Mac throwing a party for Doc, the other characters looking out for each other's well-being whenever possible. Um, a, a good example of this is Dora Flood and the efforts sh that she engages in in order to make her business seem um, legitimate, but also to help out the people in, in her community whenever possible. Allow me to read you a quote from this. But during the Depression, she was hardest hit. In addition to the usual charities, Dora saw the hungry children of Cannery Row and the jobless fathers and the worried women and Dora paid grocery bills right and left for two years and nearly went broke in the process. And you get uh, a feeling, because this is described multiple times throughout the story, uh, Dora is willing to give and give to the community even when uh, it might not seem necessarily safe because she um, she and her girls like helped people during uh, the influenza that was spreading not the worst one in the 1900 or 1919 but sometime later and so it seems like um dora is invested in, in this community's health and well-being um it, it's it's mentioned that she's doing this large uh, sometimes because uh because she wants her business to seem legit um as i've said before but it she only has to do so much for that to happen like she she went broke um, giving giving back to people during the Great Depression. And she only has to do so much in order to seem legit. So it seems like she's actually she actually cares about this place in which she lives, uh, which says a lot about the Canary Row area. And again, I think this largely has to do with circumstances, how uh, everyone in this, this area is kind of less well off. And, you know, things may, might not be going very great for them. And those circumstances are what ties them together. Um, maybe in a few years, some of them won't be, uh, you know, in the place that they're in. And that might indicate that, uh, like, they, they might not be able to be friends. Like, if Mac were to make a lot of money, he might not reach back out to the people in this community. Um, so it could be a friendship of circumstance rather than a friendship of, of a lifetime, which is, you know, how it goes sometimes. Uh, do you remember the people who, uh, who like, from your hometown, uh, like, at 30, at 40 years old? Probably not. But when you're 20, like, there seems to be a, a connection there, especially if you don't go off to college. Another interesting element of the story is the character of Mac and his uh, constant lies. Uh, Mac is constantly lying or uh, speaking his way out of, out of tough situations. At one point in the story, he's searching for frogs on private land, and the person who's landed is come up, comes up to him and with it with a gun and says, "What are you doing on my on my land? Get out!" And Mac talks his way out of the situation and, and ends up being friends with this person. He's not really telling lies in this case, but he is. Uh, whispering sort of sweet nothings to these people, saying things that they, they want to hear. Um, so I guess he has a gift for finding, you know, exactly what people want to hear and, and being agreeable in that case. Uh, but, and Mac is very much aware of his grippy nature, as are his friends. Uh, one of his friends says that he should be, uh, like, he should have been a politician, or he could have been president. And another one remarks, well, where's the fun in that? Mac would actually have to do something in that case, whereas now he's, he's, he's fine with whatever level he's at right now, which is not much. He's, he's living um, in a place based on the goodwill of Lee Chong and the rest of the people in Cannery Row. And the only thing that's preventing him from being thrown in jail or uh, just attacked by people for his unusual behavior is the, the fact that people in Cannery Row are used to him. Uh, like Doc, Doc may have slapped him in the story, but Doc, for the most part, accepts Mac for who he is and understands that he's never really going to change, even if that would make his life a little better. Um, the community has adapted to his presence, which is kind of sad when you think about it. Like the community has accepted that this man is never going to change. And Mac is aware of his of his many faults, and he he doesn't think that he's really going to change either. And for someone to accept that is is pretty harsh for for themselves to recognize that you have faults that are you're never going to grow upon and and that might help you uh, succeed later in life, especially in post-war America, because this was written in 1945. Uh, pretty pretty sad, but I think that's what uh, Steinbeck special special specializes in writing characters like Mac who are um, are faulted and who um, who like 
uh, are work against their own self-interest at times. Another element of the story that I like is the humor mixed with the, the sometimes dark moments where uh, like Steinbeck writes about a suicide that happens and then makes a joke like a, like a, like a couple paragraphs later. And uh, I feel that's unusual compared to what Steinbeck usually does in his stories. Um, I don't recall there being that much humor in East of Eden or um, in Dubious Battle, um, apart from that line that Lucas from the Bits of Lit likes, uh, which is, how do you do fellow capitalist or something like that. Um, but here you find a lot of um, unusual humor mixed with those dark moments, which is a, a nice change. Uh, but largely my, my biggest issue with this story is that it seems to not really have a purpose. Like every other story that I've read from Steinbeck, East of Eden is, is talking about, uh, the, um, the, how the problems of the Trask family trickle down into the, into other generations and how fathers, you know, seek that love from, or sons seek their love from their fathers, but often the fathers can't provide it. And there's a lot to say there. And in Dubious Battle, and Of Mice and Men, and um, Of Grapes of Wrath, um, like all of those stories talk about uh, workers' rights or something to do with the individual being screwed over by corporations or something like that. So th those stories seem to have a real purpose. But this is just a slice of life. It's talking about a community, and at the end of the day, Steinbeck doesn't go anywhere with that, with those thoughts. It just seems like these are just stuff he decided to write on paper about a community that he was familiar with, but he didn't have an end goal in mind other than showing that these people who come from a low place are all connected and, and bonded in some way or another. But I can't really like see the reasoning or purpose behind that. It it's, it's a different Steinbeck, and I wouldn't say it's bad by any means. It's just different in that I, I was expecting more uh, from Steinbeck having read his other stories at this point. Um, I, I even said, like, when I, when I was making my um, uh, TBR video that I was like, oh, I'm going to steal this from the library because it's a very fascinating cover. And it, indeed, it is a very fascinating cover. Uh, but... Uh, it's, it's a collectible from Penguin, um, if anybody wants to know. But I don't think I'm going to actually buy this now, because this isn't a story that I that I really care for all too much. Um, but I do think that there is uh, some value for someone out there if you like um, more subdued Steinbeck stories. Anyway, those were my thoughts on Cannery Row by John Steinbeck, a book that I don't really recommend. I'm not not because it's bad, just because uh, if you're looking for uh, a Steinbeck story with a punch, you're you're better off looking elsewhere. Uh, it, it is unfortunate that the last two Steinbeck stories that I read, this one and. Uh, the short story that I read recently were kind of subpar. It's kind of hoping for more given the the previous experiences I had with Steinbeck. But this is um, the moment, I guess, where I realized that Steinbeck is indeed not a god and is a mere mortal, which is a hard lesson to learn and is probably a lesson I'll be learning about several other favorite authors down the road. Um, if you read this book before, you simply want to comment on something I said here, absolutely do so below. Let's have a discussion about about Cannery Row and Steinbeck. Otherwise, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so that more people can find out about this if it is their cup of tea. And until then, I wish you the best of luck in your weird and fishy travels. Farewell.